amen. Is God good or what? Oh, come on. Is he good or what? He's good. He's good. What a beautiful morning. So glad that you're here with us. If you're new, I'm Pastor Josh, associate pastor here, and um, so glad you're here with us. Um, let me pray, and then uh, we're going to jump in. We're gonna, our goal is to be done by 1130, and who believes in miracles? Come on. I believe in miracles. Here we go. Let me pray um, just so we can see that miracle happen. Oh, Jesus, you're so good. And what a joy it is to honor you and bring our praise and bring our love and our adoration to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, with our body, with our, our hearts and our words and with everything. And I thank you, God, that you are not um, a far off God. You are Christ with us. You are Emmanuel. You are Christ with us, God with us, and you're here by your Holy Spirit. And on this day that we remember and we celebrate Pentecost Sunday, the, the, the day that your Spirit, your Holy Spirit, was poured out on all flesh, we thank you for your presence in us, among us, around us. We thank you for your presence here, and we ask Holy Spirit that you would speak to us. Thank you that you are a God that can be known, not just known about, a, a God that can be known, a God that can be experienced personally and relationally. And so we just, this morning, we just say, we just say yes to you, Holy Spirit. We just say yes to you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I got a, a word on my heart for um, for me this morning, and I'm going to share it with you. So um, I'm going to, yeah, we got, we're, we're kind of wrapping up our our series, our follow series um, that we've been going through the last few months. Um, really excited. Next Sunday, as you guys know, Leif's going to be with us, Leif Hetland, which is going to be unbelievable. So um, he's going to be with, uh, with us Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and uh, he just Man, what he carries is just so incredible. Um, the way that he ministers the, the Father's heart, um, he, like you're not going to want to miss this. Um, so make sure, yeah, make sure you come out Sunday morning, Sunday night, mark it in your calendars. It's going to be spectacular. So we're wrapping up this follow series, and um, Pastor Paul last week had an awesome message. Anybody appreciate Pastor Paul's message last week? Yeah, it was good. Such a good word. Such a good word. He's, uh, if, you haven't, if you haven't heard it, go back and take a listen. The, the, the main point is that, um, is Jesus looking to turn some tables in this temple? In this temple. Come on. That's a good word for us right here, right now. What temp, what, what tables is Jesus wanting to turn in us? Because I, Got good news, and this is this is kind of actually kind of I, I think l leads into or or maybe you know t takes us to the next step after what Jesus does when he when he when he clears the temple because when when the temple's cleared when it's cleansed it's prepared for the presence he's preparing it to f to fill it with something right and there is actually when when you when you would prepare a um, when, you, when you would prepare the temple to bring the Ark of the Covenant in, you'd actually, there would be some ceremonial sprinkling of the blood that actually cleansed the temple to prepare it for the presence. And this is not even my message, but this is such a good word right now. This is, this is the sprinkling of the blood to prepare you to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. To be the temple for Christ himself to take up residence in you so that you can be a priest, that you can be a messenger of the good news to the world, a representation of God's heart to the world. Can I get an amen? Amen. So today I, I want to talk really, wow, really briefly on just something that, that God's been speaking to me. Um, and so I'm going to invite you to turn to John 2. Anybody like the, the book of John, the gospel of John? The gospel of John is so cool. I like, I've had, man, it has just been,
blowing my mind the last couple years. Um, and if you don't know, Gospel of John is the fourth gospel. There's three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that are called the synoptic gospels. And what they do is they tell the story of Jesus. They tell the story of his life and his miracles and signs and wonders and all the stuff that he did. And throughout those gospels, we have the disciples not really getting it. <laughs> uh, they don't really understand. They see a miracle. They see a thing here and they catch these glimpses. And Peter has this moment of, surely you're the son of God, you know, at these moments. But, but the book of the, the, the gospel of John was actually written many years after those first synoptic gospels. And the Gospel of John is, is a much more, um, I, guess, I guess you would say, layered um, Gospel. Because John loves to speak and, and talk about the life of Jesus from the point of him being re, re, uh, revealed as the Son of God. You see, in the other, in the other, um, in the other Gospels, there's a transfiguration story, but in the book of John... The book of John is the transfiguration, trying to help us understand the transfiguration. And so um, the book of John is beautiful, and I, I want to read it really quick. And a couple things that stick out to us, um, you know, literally and historically. But then I want to talk about another layer um, that um, some of the early church theologians would call um, allegory or the metaphor, the, 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 a layer above what's being said, because there's something, there's something there that John is trying to say to us. There's something there that the Spirit wants to reveal to us, to show us about this man who is God. Are you guys following me? And so I, I, have, I have a little bit of word, um, and we'll get to that, and there'll be a bit of an invitation. But um, as, you, as you know, John 2 is the wedding at Cana. Anybody been into any weddings lately? Yeah, come on. It's fresh in our minds. So let me read. Let's, let's read through John 2. I'm reading from the NRSV, and we're just going to read um, the first 11 verses. Here we go. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, somebody say, when the wine gave out. <laughs> when the wine gave out. It's, it's not always the wine that gives out. Um, but when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, which is a nice thing to say in this context, okay? This is not, this is not, you know, like, woman, like, this is, this is like a, a term of endearment, okay? So Jesus isn't being disrespectful to his mother. Woman, where are we, where are we, yeah, yeah. Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, just do whatever he tells you, Okay? Now, standing there were six stone water jars. Somebody say six stone water jars. For the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. Somebody say the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water... He had, it had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Somebody say now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee. And revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Somebody say, believed in him. Believed in him. Okay. So, a couple things we want to pull out just historically and literally here. Okay, number one, Jesus went to a wedding. Right? His mom was there. Um, they ran out of wine. Um, his mom said, you know... <laughs> We need you to make more wine, which, which leads me to believe, like, what other kind of stuff did Jesus do at home when they ran out of, like, Cheerios? 
you know what I mean? It didn't see. I don't know. It doesn't seem like a, a far-fetched idea. It's like, we're out of oil again. Do you want to just, you know, do your little thing there and fill up the, I don't know. Who knows? But it's just fun, fun to think about. But Jesus said, what did he say? He said, my time has not come. Now, Jesus did lots of miracles, and he even said to some of the people that, that were healed, that he did ministry to, he said, don't tell anybody. And so this, I really believe this is not Jesus saying, hey, I'm not allowed to do any miracles right now. It's Jesus saying, I'll do this, but we have to keep it quiet. Nobody can know. Just the servants knew where it had come from. The, the, even this, like, there was no public recognition for Jesus turning water into white. Who got the, who got the, the uh, recognition? The bridegroom. There's a good word right there. The bridegroom gets the recognition for the good wine. So then we also have, we have these six water pots. Now it's interesting because um, these six water pots um, they're, it's, John's really clear that they're, they're stone water pots. Okay? It's like, there, there might have been, like in the, um, you know, they've used brass water pots before, but, but for ceremonial, ceremonial washing at home, you'd have, you'd have probably clay pots would be more of the norm. Um, but what's interesting about that is that the stone pots, um, are different than the clay pots in the sense that um, clay pots, once they've been used or defiled, they have to be broken. They have to be shattered. And they have to be done away with. But the stone pots, because stone is undefilable. So the stone pots can be used over and over again because they cannot be defiled by the ceremonial washing and the purification rites, okay? Okay. You guys follow me so far? So, and this is also interesting because there was actually a very specific period of time where, um, where the technology would have existed for them to make stone pots on a stone lathe. That actually, like, I don't know if you've ever tried to make a water pot out of stone. Like, like it's going to crack on you, right? So you need technology. And the Romans actually had technology um, right around that time, which helps us to place Jesus' life historically in, in the timeline. Right? That helps us put Jesus in a historical point, time and space. How many, anybody, anybody believe that the scriptures, Jesus says the scripture, scriptures testify of me. Does anybody believe that? That's what the scriptures are doing. They're trying to testify that Jesus, this man, is the son of God. Okay? So this, in this beautiful way, six stone pots places Jesus in a very specific time and space. Isn't that cool? That's a really cool thing. And, um, and it was right around, yeah, it was right around this time that they, um, it would have been very expensive to get those stone pots made because actually the technology was used to, uh, by the Romans to make um, pillars, to make their stone pillars for their architecture which is very interesting, and there'll be another point about that later. You guys having fun yet? Anybody like historical things, historical sign Yes, I love it. So we got six, six stone water pots. They fill them with fresh water. And Jesus turned the water into what? Wine. Wine. That is a historical, literal translation, interpretation, water to wine. And at the end, the headmaster of the wedding honored the bridegroom for saving the best for last. The word that John actually uses is the, the best over the inferior. It's very interesting. That's an important word. And I don't have time to teach on this because the time is already gone, actually. Um, but don't look at it. N nothing to see. Um, uh, and, then, and then at the end, the disciples believe. So... So there's some historical, literal stuff to pull out of the text. Love it. It's, 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 it's fun to read. I love reading that stuff. I love learning historical context and all of that. Now I want to talk about another layer. I want to talk about another layer that, that John is actually, I believe that John is trying to communicate to us. And then there's, I believe there's a word in there for us. So we know that the scripture is multifaceted. Does anybody believe that? Multifaceted, okay? There are many interpretive styles and lenses which it can be read. 
Some of, some of you probably know the different interpretive lenses. There's literal, moral, allegorical, um, anagogical. So there's these, these different, we're not going to go into that today. Um, but specifically in the book of John, um, he's using um, allegory and metaphor. And what Paul would use, the language he would use is, somebody say type and shadow. Shadow, Okay. Uh, and so this is, this is what John is employing a lot in his, in his gospel here. There's strong themes that point us to something else. He's speaking historically, telling a story, but also trying to point us to something else. Just like Jesus says, you read the scriptures because you think in them you can find salvations, but I tell you the truth that the scriptures, what? Testify of me. Okay. Even said, Jesus says, Moses spoke of me. Do you hear that? Do you think that they believed that when they heard that? No, no. So we have to read the scriptures in a different way, and we do, because we read them on this side of the cross, knowing who Jesus is, the Son of God, fully man, fully God. And what he did and what he accomplished on the cross is, was foreshadowed in the Old Testament in a way that we could not see until he came and embodied it. Are you guys with me? We're running deep, deep waters now. We're just, we're going for it, okay? I want to save time, so we're just going, okay? One of the simple facts about John is that it doesn't follow the chronology of the other synoptic gospels. Because I believe that John is trying to communicate something to us that's very, that, that's different. Now, this miracle that we just read is the very first recorded miracle of Jesus. You guys with me? Following me? Now, what J- Jesus says shortly after this in John 2.19 He tells the Pharisees, uh, he says, you will tear this temple down and I will rebuild it in how many days? In three days. Now, is Jesus speaking literally there about the literal physical temple? No. What is he speaking about? Himself. He's speaking about himself. He says that Moses spoke of me. And so what's to be seen here is that this tabernacle that Jesus is speaking of, the tabernacle that even Moses spoke of, is just a shadow of the tabernacle that Jesus is. It's not the other way around. It's not Jesus' is metaphorically a representation of the earthly tabernacle. It's that the earthly tabernacle is a shadow of the person of Jesus. Does anybody believe that? This is the truth. And so what John's trying to get us to see here is, and the way he's arranged his gospel is not necessarily chronological, but it is arranged through the stations of the temple. Once you enter into the outer gates and you pass that that sac- the the altar of sacrifice, what do you go through before you enter into the holy place? Anybody? It's the golden laver. What's the golden laver for? Ceremonial washing. Why? So you won't die when you enter into the holy place. That's literally what it says in Exodus 27. So the, 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 the priests could wash their hands and feet so that the, when they stepped in the holy place, they wouldn't die. And John 2, the very first miracle, the grounding miracle that Jesus does is he takes the ceremonial washing, the water of the ceremonial washing, He takes that and he turns it into something, somebody say, new. New. Because what he's trying to show us is that thing that existed, 
is actually pointing to him. And he's fulfilling it. He is accomplishing it. And he is making a way for us to enter into the holy place, which is him. <laughs> him. It's all about him. This is what's so radical. The, the six stone water pots. Stone. Stone. Paul says, Paul says in Corinthians, that Jesus Christ is the rock that followed them in the wilderness. That they drank from, that the water came out from. Psalm 118 says that he was the stone that the, the builders rejected. Isn't it also crazy that, that, that the, potentially those stone pots would have been made in a factory that builds pillars. Stones for pillars. Cornerstones. Think about that. And that Moses, when he went on the mountain to get, to get all of these, um, to get all of the instructions for this temple, he was in the cloud for six days. Six water pots. Six is the number. Who was created on the sixth day? Man. Six is pointing us to something. And I believe, I believe that what John is trying to point us to is that Jesus, the stone that can't be defiled, that can't be defiled. See other clay pots? They could get defiled by the ceremonial washing and they'd have to be destroyed. But Jesus is the stone that brings forth the water in the desert. Jesus is the undefilable stone. Jesus is the perfect stone. For all of the law and all of the prophets to be filled up so that it can be transformed into something new. He doesn't do away with, he doesn't abolish the law, he fulfills it. He is the fulfillment of all of it. And instead of filling the water and, 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 be, and having it being poured out on us to, to wash us externally, he turns it into a substance that's meant to be taken internally. And when we take it in, we know that we're drinking not of water, we're not drinking of some natural substance, we are drinking of a new work, a work that was completed. He turns the ceremonial, the, 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 the purification rites and all of that, the law, he turns into an intoxicating substance that's completed in him. In him, it's completed. And now the finished work of Christ is for us to, to, to drink of, to partake of, to take in and experience the transformation where? On the outside? On the inside. You guys tracking with me? Does this sound like good news? Does this sound like Jesus? Does this sound like Jesus? So we know that so much more is going on here than meets the eye. There's something deeper. There's something higher. So I want to read for you really quickly, quickly 2 Corinthians 3. Since then we have such a hope. We act with great boldness, not like Moses who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of glory that was being set aside, but their minds were hardened indeed to this very day. When they hear the reading of the old covenant, that same veil is there since only Christ has set it aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Somebody say removed. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes, to the, for this comes from the Lord, the spirit. Somebody say the spirit. 
Today we're celebrating Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday, where the disciples were gathered in the upper room doing what they knew to do. Praying. How many times did they pray? How many times did they pray with Jesus? How many times did they do this thing that they knew? And Jesus said, wait and pray. And they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And then the Spirit rushed in. The Spirit came upon them. And they experienced a brand new reality. They were doing something that they knew, and they experienced something that they never knew, knew before. Something absolutely brand new. What was happening is the actual transformation of water to wine. Because <laughs> what, what did everybody who was watching the whole situation think? What did they think? They were drunk. But they were drinking a new wine. They were drinking a new wine. And I believe that this morning there's an invitation. There's an invitation. There's three invitations. There's three takeaways that I want to land on really quick. It's number one, the stone water pots. Christ in himself fulfills the law and transfigures what is used for ceremonial cleansing externally. The law. Religion. Into a transformative drink that we partake and it does its work on the inside. Can I get an amen? The stone water pots. Number two, the water. He takes what is natural and elemental. Nobody drinks water. Oh, wow, it's fruity. Fruity water. Mm, do you taste the, mm, the nice flavors in that? What? No. Nobody drinks. It's, we drink water out of necessity because our doctor tells us you need to be hydrated, right? It's like we just, we just drink it down. It's not... Water's not to be enjoyed. It is for utility, right? We add things to water to make it a little bit more enjoyable, but it's not like you don't sit, uh, you know, on the deck and swish it around in your mouth a little bit and try to taste all the little bits of chlorine. Like, we're, it's purely utility, right? Jesus turns what was utility. Jesus turns what was, was simple and elemental and makes it into something wholly different, he wants to transfigure us. You see, the practices we've talked about, the practices of worship, of serving, of giving, of learning, of discipling. Uh, we talk, you know, the, 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 the practices of prayer and reading and all of these things. These practices are meant for us to draw on that resource of Jesus, to draw on, on him what he's accomplished. Not try to fill our own water jugs. That's not what it's about. The practices are for us to draw from what Christ has accomplished and to drink from that, to drink from him, to become div partakers of the divine nature, to drink it in, to experience, to experience the transformation, experience the intoxication of the life of Christ in us, the life of the age to come we get to experience now. Can I get an amen? Amen. This is not about, this whole thing of Christianity is not about just doing the right things until Jesus comes. This is about a relationship. This is about intimacy. This is about life being experienced, the life of the age to come being experienced here and now so that we can be the message of that future kingdom coming and people would want it. I don't think you guys are getting it. This is good news. So we don't do these, pro these, these practices from duty to perform a duty for him. When done in partnership with the Spirit, they're meant to transform us. We take in the finished work of Christ. We meditate on that. We take it in and it transforms us. It changes us. And the third point, the wine. Jesus saves the best for last. Somebody say, saves the best for last. The best for last. He saves the best for last. He is always doing the best right now. The best right now. The best for last. The best in this moment. Jesus saves the best for last. He's inviting us to partake in the new wine that his finished works have prepared for us. Those who are running out of their own wine are invited to come and drink. 
And this is the invitation. The Spirit is indwelling us and, 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 and bringing us into an experiential knowledge, not just a knowledge about, bringing us, us into a knowing, an intimacy with the Father, Son, and Spirit. This is what Jesus is, in, this is what the Holy Spirit is inviting us into. When we're running out of our own wine, he saves the best for last. And he's like, hey, you want to try some of mine? <laughs> Do you want to try some of my wine? It's better. It's better than whatever you brought to the table. It's better. And sometimes we actually have to run out of our own wine so that all we have left is his. And to draw on that. And this is the invitation this morning. So number one, as you... The invitation is, will you receive the good news? Will you receive what Christ has done on your behalf? And if there's anybody in here that hasn't received the love of Christ, that hasn't made a decision to follow him, this is your moment. This is your invitation right now. I recognize pretty much anyone, everyone in here, but, but if, if you haven't made that decision, I want to invite you to stand right now. There is new wine. There is a new life for you that Jesus has accomplished, and he's inviting you into it. Okay. Amen. Good. But this is the invitation for all of us on, on Pentecost Sunday. I feel there's an invitation for us who have run out of wine. Maybe some of the, the, the practices, maybe some of your, your Christian life and your Christian practices, maybe they've just, they've become stale. Maybe you just run out. And there's an invitation this morning to partake in new wine. And if that's you, I want to invite you to stand up right now. Go ahead, stand up if that's you. And maybe for you, you've had the knowledge of God. You've learned about him and you've, you've never experienced that a water to wine transformation, an, an experience of the life of the Holy Spirit, the life of Christ on, on the inside. You've never experienced the reality of his indwelling life in you. And if that's you, I want to invite you to stand too. Because we know that God is a God that, that, is, that, that wants to be known, that it invites us to experience him, to know him. This is a knowing Ty, I'm going to invite you to just come and play, if you can, please. Is Ty there? Yeah. So this is the invitation. Go ahead, open your hands. Holy Spirit, we love you. We love you. We love you. Jesus, we recognize that this is what you love to do. You turn water into wine. You take even our dirty washing water of our religious religiosity and you turn it into something new. That in you, there is a brand new life. There's a brand new experience, a brand new encounter with the life of Jesus waiting for us. And so, Holy Spirit, right now, we just submit. We just submit to you. And go ahead, just invite him. Invite Holy Spirit. Turn water into wine. Turn water into wine. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Yeah, come, Holy Spirit. Yeah, let your focus be single right now. Let your focus be on him. I invite you, Holy Spirit, to wash over us right now.
Come in like a rushing wind. Come in like a rushing wind. Come, Holy Spirit. Go ahead. If you just begin to pray, just to to declare your need for him. Just declare your need for him. Go ahead. Just declare your need for him. Holy Spirit, we need you. Holy Spirit, I need you. I need a fresh drink, a fresh encounter. Thank you, Jesus. You make all things new. Come, Holy Spirit. Just sing this out. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Yes, sing it out. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence. Lord, sing out and Holy Spirit, Worship you, we worship you, we worship you, we worship you. Turn the water into wine. Oh, we worship you. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for this word. Thank you that you're making the ordinary extraordinary. Thank you that you're not interested in just simply external cleaning, but internal transformation. And we just, we thank you so much. So we invite you. We invite you, pour pour in the oil and the wine. Like, Lord Jesus, pour it, pour it out on us, pour it in us. Thank you that all we need to do is drink. (laughs) So good. So good. Wow, there's just nothing that we can do to make it right when you've because you've done it all for us and we we receive that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.